Check it out now, y'all. Nano Hub U online instruction. Welcome back. Uh, I hope uh, you are understanding and enjoying the course uh, so far. Uh, we are now in the second part of, of this course where we'll be talking about the sensitivity of a biosensor. Now relating the first part to the second part, in the first part we essentially have talked about that when the molecule diffuses around, how long does it take for the molecules to land on the sensor surface and we have seen that that really depends on the geometry of the nanobiosensors and how the particles diffuse towards the sensor surface. Now, once the molecules have come and landed on the sensor surface, the question is, how many molecules would you really need in order for the sensor to respond? Now, an analogy might be useful for this to interpret how the second part is related to the first part. Assume that you are looking for a bird in Amazon, let's say, and you have camped somewhere. Now, of course, the bird has to diffuse around or fly around and it has to come to your, uh, come to where you are in order for it to be detected. However, it doesn't matter at that, until that point the bird comes that whether how many megapixels of camera do you have. But once the BART comes, at that point, it matters a great deal of what type of camera you have in order to take its picture. So we are talking about the quote-unquote camera in this section of this talk. There will be nine uh, lectures uh, in this segment and we'll go through them one at a time. So let me begin with some definitions and various types of nanobiosensors that one might expect to find in, in a typical laboratory. So I'll begin with some background and introduction and I'll remind you about the importance of geometry of diffusion. That's the first thing uh, for a nanobiosensors being able to detect ultra low concentration and then we'll be talking about three types of nanobiosensors and I remind you that there are many many extraordinary nanobiosensors, but the three that we'll be talking about are in some way label-free or tag-free, that it depends on the intrinsic property of the sensor itself or intrinsic property of the biomolecule itself to get the transduction process. And then we'll begin to discuss one of the three, which is potentiometric sensor. And finally, I will say I will begin to explain why a simple understanding of the potentiometric theory, uh, potentiometric sensor, because after all it has been around as you will see for 100 years almost, why that really doesn't do it and you need to understand the problem a little bit more deeply before you can understand the operation of a potentiometric sensor and then I will conclude. Now a nanobiosensor as you have shown here is always helpful because as I told you that nanomolecules or biomolecules are generally very small in size like a segment of a DNA. A 100 base pair DNA would be only 3.4 nanometer uh, long and as you saw glucose molecules, protein molecules very small. So it always helps for a biomolecule uh, to be comparable in size with the nanobiosensors because the sensitivity as you might expect would be somewhat larger once it lands on the sensor surface. Now of course the opposite is also true that if a sensor is very big, a classical sensor for example, uh, in that case uh, even if it had a mosquito bite, an elephant of a sensor in that sense, it probably wouldn't even notice. So the bottom line I want to point out that if a sensor doesn't notice analyte or can detect, cannot detect it, then as if the analyte doesn't exist and therefore the sensor is actually useless. So it's very important therefore that the sensor be at nanoscale if we want to detect uh, molecules which are small and few in number so that it can have a sensitive response. Now, just to uh, remind you where we are uh, in this broad scheme of things, 
In the first part, I discussed that how the sensitivity might go from millimolar all the way to femtomolar or atomolar simply by the geometry of diffusion. You may recall that these devices have different fractal dimension and therefore it can capture particles. It captures the particles from the diffusion field, biomolecules from the diffusion field in a different way. So these two do it and does it in a different way. But once you have it in this region, let's say a picomolar sensitivity, then the specific design can make it whether it is 0.1 picomolar or whether it is 10 picomolar. So that range, that type of range would then be critically dependent on the design and the transduction mechanism and operating principle of the sensor themselves. In that case, it is no longer sensor agnostic. Now, let me remind you uh, about how these various pieces are related. Assume that we are thinking about a nanobiosensor and the sensor is uh, decorated with some capture probe, let's say a segment of DNA. We'll talk about this details of these segments towards the end of the course, but for the time being, let's just assume that it is a, it's a, essentially a glue. And then that in the presence of this uh, capture probe, there'll be a current from source to drain, and these would be the background current denoted by, let's say, G0, the conductance G0. And then, once the molecule arrives, it will take a certain amount of time. Once the molecule arrives, this extra charge will change the potential of this sensor and therefore change the conductivity. The red line essentially says the increase in conductivity or decrease increase in conductivity from source to drain because in response to the charges of the biomolecule. So the response time, the first part of the course, simply asks how long it takes before the molecule comes. And the sensitivity simply says that once it comes, how big a change in the signal does it produce in order for the, sensing, for the biomolecule to be detected. So if you looked at the same formula that we have derived before, which was defined the limits of detection, one is this diffusion limit, that is the part one of the course, which is the past 12 uh, lectures. But the topic that we'll be talking about is how many molecules do you need, really need, in order for this sensor to respond. So we are going to discuss the physics of NS, and the physics of NS depends on specific sensor technology. Now, there are two different ways of detecting it. I want to specify that before. Assume that you have a sensor and that uh, arrow shaped region, that's really the receptor probe and the biomolecule comes and attaches to this. We can have charge mass electron affinity uh, as a tag or as a marker for the biomolecule. And now if it is an electrical based sensor, then we can simply look at the change in the current associated with the biomolecule, or if it's an optical based um, uh, sensor, then we can simply ask the question that how the refracti refle uh, uh, reflective reflectivity of the surface changes once the biomolecule has been attached to the sensor surface. So we can essentially interrogate one of these properties by using one of these trans transduction mechanism. That's the general principle of any sensor. Now, I have already mentioned that there are three types that we'll be talking about. One is called this potentiometric sensors where the charge of a biomolecule is reflected in the source to drain current. I will explain that a little bit later. There are other techniques called amperometric techniques and then there will be cantilever based sensors, which essentially measures the mass to the translation change in the frequency. Today, 
I wish to focus on the potentiometric sensor. This is a, one of the most beautiful, uh, at least from a physics perspective, one of the most beautiful illustration of a sensor technology that has wide technological relevance. I'll just remind you why these things are in the broader context of uh, context of other sensor technology. You might remember in the in the first lecture, uh, I mentioned that there is a uh, corresponding history of uh, biotechnology and there is a corresponding uh, history of nanotechnology evolving, electronics uh, evolving. And one of the first sensors that was ever developed was a pH based sensor. This was used to measure the acidity of orange juices and this made, as I mentioned, Beckman a billionaire. So that was almost 100 years ago, 7500 years ago, but the sensor, this potentiometric sensors is continues to be very important even as late as this year. So there is a wide variety of application and in particular for genome sequencing. I will start from here and then I will go back in history, talk about the pH sensor a little bit and then come back again at the very end. So the applications that we'll be looking into essentially spans almost a history of 100 years compressed within an hour or so. Now before I get into this potentiometric sensors, there are many different types of potentiometric sensors, but we'll be talking about one which can be miniaturized, which can be used, integrated with other things based on nanotechnology. And one of the most important ones are of course transistor based, transistors based uh, potentiometric sensors. Here is how it works. This is a transistor physics in a single slide. You know, if you take a resistor and try to see a uh, put a voltage across it, then there will be a current flow. That's Ohm's law, right? And the current depends on the electronic charge, the number of electrons or number of charge carriers you have, the velocity through which they are moving and the cross-sectional area. So that many particles are moving at a certain speed that gives you the current and that gives you this I equals GV, the conductance multiplied by the voltage V because the velocity is directly proportional to the voltage you have applied. Now a MOSFET is a slightly uh, generalized version of this register. The idea is this, that you still have sort of a register. This is called a source, this is a drain, and there is an insulator which separates a gate region from the quote unquote channel region. And the purpose of this blue gate is to modulate the value of N. Now, if the transistor is said to be operating in accumulation, if, if you had whatever number type of charge carrier you originally had, let's say you had electrons, if you have more of it in response to this gate charge or gate potential, then you have accumulated more and therefore we call transistor is operating in, transistor is operating in accumulation. There are two other uh, methods by which uh, you can operate the transistor. One is that you can, by applying a voltage, you can essentially deplete these regions of mobile charges. In that case, the total current after the charge comes will be lower. Regardless, from the delta I, you should still be able to detect the presence of the biomolecules shown here in blue. And that approach, because here charges are being pushed away, is called depletion mode operation. And finally, there's something called an inversion mode operation. Let's say you had n type of bulk charge carriers in the beginning, before the biomolecules came. Once the biomolecules came, biomolecule, let's say you have positive charges induced because these are negative charges. So there are the charge carriers are now are opposite type. Their type has been inverted and therefore it's called an inversion. Now in all these three cases where the transistor operates, we are really focusing on modulating the number N 
through the biomolecules. You see, for this technology, we don't really worry about the V per se, because we apply a small amount of voltage, and therefore, voltage is directly proportional to the electric field and given by the drain voltage and the length of the channel and the multiplied by the mobility. Bottom line is that unlike a transistor, semiconductor transistor, which is often very complicated because of the complication of V in some sense, will not be a factor here. We'll just be focusing on N and how the biomolecules change N. So let's begin. Assume that you have a certain number of analytes which are coming to the biosensor surface. And the current before the biomolecule landed on the sensor surface, or if you remember the Amazon bard came to view of your lens, so to speak. Before that, I will call the current ID coming from source to drain. And after the molecules have landed, here for example, I show four molecules, there would be corresponding charges because it's like a capacitor separated by a dielectric. Four positive charges will be compensated by four negative charges, let's say. And therefore, this extra charge will change the current. And therefore, the definition of sensitivity is this relative change before and after normalized to the original current. And essentially, we'll be calculating this for various cases, because if you knew how many molecules do you would need in order to have a certain change in delta i, that is really what we are after. That should be a simple calculation, you see. This is simple in the following way. Assume that in this picture, I have taken the original transistor, which was lying vertical, the oxide was lying vertical, and I have turned it sideways. And so now my source is here, my drain is here, and the biomolecules are on the left, and the extra charges, these green charges, are on the sensor surface. Let's assume accumulation mode operation. Electron is going from, or the, uh, the current is going from bottom to the top, through the source and drain. Now, of course, if you have a certain amount of positive charge from the biomolecule, the channel would correspondingly have a negative charge to compensate for it. This is capacitor, basic capacitor. And therefore, what would be your current? This change in the current will be whatever the extra charge, the MOS charge is, because it's called metal oxide semiconductor. Oxide is this oxide, OX, and semiconductor is the channel generally original technology has a metal gate and that has been removed and so therefore this is called a MOS. Q MOS means charge on the MOSFET which is the green charge and it will be equal to the charge on the biomolecule because these two have to be equal across a capacity, the blue and the green. And that you could also write if you wanted to as the capacitance multiplied by the extra potential. That's good. Biomolecules have landed with a certain charge. Remember, it could be DNA or it could be protein, which has a certain amount of charge. The charge is reflected on the channel. Your current changes. You have detected the biomolecules. You may think that you can go home, but not really. And I'll explain why. Just to remind you one, uh, one quick thing that this type of calculation we have done before, very quickly you may remember the, the analysis I just showed was a general analysis, but for the particular case of a nanowire sensor, for this geometry of electrostatic in that discussion, we also did the same thing. We looked at the current before. This is the total number of carriers, cross-sectional area, multiplied by the velocity, through of the uh, charge carriers through this nanowire sensor. Once the molecule, red molecule landed on the sensor surface, it depleted the charge carriers. That was the white region with a new effective radius RA for conduction. Before it was RB, now it's RA. So you do the current before and after and you may remember, just a quick reminder, that sensitivity could be calculated as a difference between before and after divided by before, 
and we calculated this. So this is nothing should not be surprising. Uh, this calculation of sensitivity in some way we have already done. But in that case we found that that was a relatively small effect. But now we want to explore that small effect because that's really important in terms of design of the biosensor itself. Now let's continue. Let's say I have already told you about how many biomolecules that, that once you have a certain number of blue biomolecules on the sensor surface, you have a certain number of green uh, inversion or accumulation charge and you can detect, detect the uh, corresponding presence of the biomolecule. Now let's remind ourselves that these biomolecules came from this capture and release equation. You remember that the first part is capture and the second part is release. And if you wait long enough, then in that case, the equilibrium concentration of biomolecules will be equal to, can be obtained by setting this equal to zero. Now the bottom line I want to point out is the number of biomolecules in that context is directly proportional to the density of analyte you have in the solution. So it's a fair measure of how many molecules you have in the solution. Now, therefore, you could immediately say that your current should be proportional to the mole charge in the biomolecule, but that biomolecule is proportional to the analyte density. So therefore, if you measured the current at one nanomolar versus one micromolar, then the current should increase by three orders of magnitude because the analyte density has increased by three orders of magnitude. And if you did an optical experiment where instead of interrogating the current itself going from the bottom source to the top drain, if you just put an optical tag, just counted how many molecules are coming in, but optically detected how many have landed and how many have conjugated, if you did that, then you'd see that indeed this is the case. If it's a linear dependence, take a log on both sides on a log log plot, essentially a linear dependence at an extra high concentration, of course, the surface is saturated, you don't get any additional enhancement. But the theory appears to be correct. Now this word appears is the key one because you see, it's the optical response. I haven't yet shown you what the electrical current does. Unfortunately, it turns out that if you looked at the corresponding electrical current, you would find a completely different story. What you do find that in this case, although both axes are log, essentially a linear dependence. In here, if you looked at the relative change in the current divided by the original current, remember the sensitivity, as a function of log of concentration, you would find that this axis is not a log. This is a linear axis. And in fact, there are many experiments which have shown this linear to log dependence. Do you understand what it just happened? You see here, if you increased the concentration by a factor of, let's say 10, then from, or let's say from 10 to 100, then in this case, there would be almost a factor of 10 enhancement in the intensity because the intensity has simply goes linearly proportional, it's linearly proportional to the density. Here, however, what it means that you will have only a factor of two in, in, uh, enhancement because for log of concentration, you have linear increase. Potentiometric sensors turns out to be far less sensitive than what you'd have expected same from a classical simple theory. What has gone wrong? And that is the essence of the story that I'm going to tell you in next six lectures. You see, in order to understand it, I will just tell you the basic thing that we missed. The MOSFET that we considered is really not exactly like a classical MOSFET. I cheated a little bit. I have to come clean and once I do from the next lecture onward, you will see how important those additional pieces of information are. This is the original, original MOSFET with a metal gate, channel and an oxide. That's where the word MOS comes from.
Now, when you made a biosensor, when you made a biosensor, we essentially pushed the metal electrode up in here as a reference electrode and filled it with fluid, water, for example. So this region is now exposed. Now, when the biomolecules came, they came within the fluid. The gate was actually here, and then they changed the, uh, changed the conductivity or conductance of this, uh, uh, of this biosensor. And often we simply treated them as a homogeneous charge. That's what we did. But you see, one thing we forgot to mention, and which is that this region, this fluid, is not just pure water. You need salt in it. Now, why would you need salt? That's where the real trick is that will explain the logarithmic dependence that we saw in the last case. The salt is the culprit. The reason we need salt, you may remember that let's assume that this is the biosensor surface. This is the DNA, which is trying to capture the diffusing target molecule. And once the target molecule comes, they are, they essentially bind with each other. Up to that point, no problem. But do you realize that this, I told you this before, that this biomolecule is negatively charged. Another set of biomolecule, the DNA that just came in, is also negatively charged. How is it possible that they are going to essentially not rip each other out? How is it possible that they will stay together? It turns out the only way you can make them stay together is put them in salt. So that this repulsion, let's say sodium chloride, the sodium atoms essentially come inside. They essentially prevent the mutual repulsion or reduce the mutual repulsion so that they can stay together. And this mutual repulsion, this role of salt, salt coming in, essentially drains away a certain fraction of this charge so the MOSFET underneath doesn't really see it. You see, the salt is very important. Without the salt, the two DNA molecules, let's say we have in our genome, in a genome about 4 billion long the chain, uh, 4 billion base pair long DNA chain. The two DNAs in air would have repelled each other as if, if you held an apple in your hand, the force, you had a certain amount of force trying to pull it down. The force of repulsion has the same magnitude. So therefore, it would be impossible without salt. Essentially, all our DNAs would self-explode. They will essentially repel each other very quickly. So by understanding this potentiometric sensors, we are sort of understanding a basic physics of why we exist and why we are stable to begin with. So what I want to conclude with is that the classical, if you did a simple classical theory, it predicts the sensitivity should be proportional to the analyte density. There's no salt anywhere, no dependence of salt, no discussion about time, how long it takes for a certain sensitivity to be achieved. In practice, once you do the theory correctly, you will see the dependence is really logarithmic on density, logarithmic on salt concentration, and the time comes as a log also. So therefore, the sensor actually, a potentiometric sensor responds far more weakly compared to what you have expected from a naive perspective. So let me conclude here. Uh, I told you in the beginning two things define sensor response. One is this geometry of diffusion, how essentially particles come and land on the sensor surface. And second is the transduction mechanism, that once it lands, how it changes the observable that we are looking into. Now, geometry of diffusion defines the ultimate limit, while the geometry and the transduction together define the sensor-specific limit. You know, the transduction mechanism defines the factor Ns, the number of molecules you need in order for the sensor to give a signal beyond uh, uh, signal that can be detected. There are many types of sensors and we are discussing this potentiometric sensors based on transistor technology, 
uh, which can be integrated. And as I have told you, that this is a very important technology to begin with. So therefore, understanding how this potentiometric sensors work is very important. But we ran into a trouble, right? We saw that if you just take a normal transistor, put some charge in it, uh, you expect a linear dependence with analyte density, very sensitive in that case. Turned out that it has only a logarithmic dependence. And we suspect that salt has something to do with it. That discussion will be up next. And until next time, take care.